Good morning, everyone. Good to see you here today. If you have your Bible with you, just turn to the book of John. And we are on John chapter 14. And today we'll be in verses 7 through 11. Last week, of course, we did uh, verses 1 through 6. And if you need a Bible, didn't happen to bring one in, just raise your hand and we'll make sure you have one to uh, look at and read with us. Uh, last week, we were, were gathered together. Pre- I say last week, sometimes I'm, I do that when there's a... It was Easter, though, but before that, we were in John chapter 14, 1 through 6, and uh, we've been following along, going along verse by verse, and there in John chapter 14, 1 through 6, we're, we're carrying on, this is the night of Jesus' betrayal that begins back in John chapter 13, and John packs more information in that portion of the life of Jesus than any of the other gospel writers. So even though it is the night of his betrayal, we are quite a, quite a number of sermons away to getting him betrayed, all right? Uh, there's a lot of meat that John packs in there and records uh, on what Jesus teaches them the night of his betrayal. Uh, we covered last week that Jesus had told the disciples that he is going away. He told them that he was going to be lifted up or crucified. He told them that they were going to abandon him, and they all said, no, we will definitely not do that. Peter says, you know, even if they all fall away, I will not fall away, Lord. And Jesus tells him, actually, you tonight, before the rooster crows three times, Peter, three times, you're going to deny me. Uh, So at this point, we realize in John chapter 14, Jesus says that their hearts were troubled. There's a lot happening all at once. Jesus came in like a king. He came in, they're yelling, Hosanna, and yet now he's saying he's going to be crucified. They're going to abandon him. Peter's going to deny him. Uh, what all is going on, their hearts are troubled. We took note that in those passages in John chapter 14 that Jesus tells them uh, to not let their hearts be troubled. There in verse 1, let your hearts not be troubled. He gives them a, a negative command as far as the word not there, something to not do. So when when uh, we think things are chaotic in our lives, even we took note that this this could be applied in a healthy way to our lives. Uh, when things are happening that you don't understand, when things seem chaotic, when things seem out of control, this is a good verse to go to. What should you do? Uh, Number one, let your hearts not be troubled. Trust in the sovereignty of God. Trust in the power of God. Trust in the plan of God. And then next, he says, believe in God. Believe also in me. And this is a great memory verse, a great one that might slap on your refrigerator, your mirror, or wherever you want this thing to remind you, let your hearts not be troubled. What should you do instead? The positive, believe in God, believe in Jesus, trust in him, all right? So we took note of that last week. Uh, also, we, we realized that Jesus is comforting them as their hearts are troubled by letting them know that he is going to prepare a place for them. He is going to be with his father, and he is preparing a place for them. Thomas, of course, asked, you know, we don't know how to get there. How do we get there? And he's saying, me, it is I. I am, using that Exodus 3, verse 14, name of God. I am who I am. Tell them I am has sent you. Jesus picks up on that name of God and says, I am. And then he gives a comparison, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And he lets the disciples know that you do know the way. I am the way, and outside of me, there is no other way to heaven. So we take comfort in those passages as well in times of trouble, reminding ourselves not to be troubled. Trust in God. Believe in God. Believe in Jesus Christ. Know that he has a plan for you. Know where your road ends. It ends in heaven, in the Father's house, and Jesus has prepared the way for you. Now, let's continue on verse 7 through 10. Now, we've kind of caught up a bit. In verse 7, I'll read, and I'll read through verse 11, sorry. If you had known me, Jesus said, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us your word to reflect on, to study, to meditate on today. We pray that we would, uh, that, that what is taught here, the, the doctrines that are taught here, Lord, that we would ascribe to fully. And today as we deal with some, some uh, interesting texts, some, some difficult texts for us to wrap our minds around, I pray that you would guide us, may the Holy Spirit guide us, Lord, as we look into these things to a clear understanding of the truth that John is bringing forth. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, well, in today's verses, and I'm just throwing this out there as a forewarning, uh, some passages, especially doing expositional, exegetical through the book, sometimes you arrive at very applicable, practical passages. And those that like that kind of a sermon always are quick to say, great practical sermon, Pastor, you did a good job. I'm like, I'm just going through the text, you know, and that's the, that's the way it landed. And then others uh, are, are very heavy in doctrine. And it's very heady and very heavy and very intellectual. And you're trying to get all these theological principles just right and think these things through. And those are more that minded. You're like, oh, great theological lessons today, Pastor. You did a great job, you know. And so I'm just here to tell you today we're leaning more towards that on today's passage. So it is very much heavy in doctrine, heavy in theology. But also at the same time, keep this in mind, this is Jesus' last lessons he is teaching his disciples. It is heavy in doctrine, but yet it is definitely applicable. And he wants them to apply this doctrine to their belief. So, so a lot of times you'll see some passages are very doctrinal heavy, some are very practical, and, uh, but almost every time there are to be a blend, a blend there. We are to apply these doctrines, and that's what we're going to be looking at today. Uh, so it is heavy in doctrine. So let's look at verse 7 to begin with. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Now, what does Jesus mean by questioning their knowledge of him? They, think about it. He's been, they've been with him for over three years, around three years at this point. Uh, early when Jesus calls Nathaniel to uh, be his disciple, John 149, I mean, Nathaniel answers him by saying, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Sounds very knowledgeable, right? And that, but as we've seen, as we've gone through the book of John, the disciples had in mind who they wanted the Christ to be, who they wanted the Messiah to be, and uh, it was different than what what Jesus had actually come to do and his title and his position and the description of him is not lining up with what they want from him. So they, but, but we see that there are some good, some good things are, they are saying and they're coming around to some good truths, but yet they're not fully there. Uh, Peter's confession is really good. Matthew 16, 26, Simon Peter, after Jesus is asking, who do the people say that I am? And they give different, maybe Elijah, maybe Jeremiah, maybe a great prophet. And what does Peter say? No, 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 you, you are Christ, the Son of God. And it, 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 this is huge. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And what does Jesus say? My, you blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because God the Father has revealed this to you. And it seems like, wow, he's got it down. He knows exactly who Jesus is. And then the very next few verses you find out, Jesus is saying, Peter, get behind me. Because you're being used by Satan himself, trying to get me not to go to the cross. So there's constant confusion on the full identity of Jesus Christ. So in verse 7, we find out that some of that is still remaining. He says in John chapter 14, verse 7, If you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So to a degree, they know who Jesus is. To a degree, they know who the Father is, but they're still lacking. They had been through all of his teaching. They had heard all these I am statements that we've been going over in the book of John. They would seen him walk on water. They would seen him raise the dead. They've seen him heal the lame, heal the blind, heal the deaf, cast out demons. They've seen him turn water into wine, etc., etc. So they've, they've been around him. They've seen his teaching. They've seen the miracles. They know a lot. They know more than anyone else, but yet... There's still something not quite fully there. So what does Jesus mean by saying to know him is to know and see the Father? And this is where we get into some Trinitarian concepts, some Trinitarian teaching that, that is uh, very deep and quite mysterious, all right? Is Jesus saying that he is God the Father? 
Don't answer out loud just in case you get it wrong, but the answer is no. <laughs> All right? He is not saying that. Uh, is he saying that Jesus incarnate is actually God the Father, not the Son? No, he's not, not saying that either. Uh, but yet there is something that is so alike that Jesus can say to know and see him rightly is also to know and to see the Father. And yet we know that Jesus and the Father are absolutely together on purpose, but there, yet there's something more that is going on here as well. So this has to do with the unity of the Trinity, and we're going to look more in that. But when you get to the complicated verses like this, are more, are more, more difficult to understand verses, it's good to let Scripture help interpret Scripture. And John does a great job of that. If you just isolate one verse, like, like if you were not preaching through the book of John and we just came to this one verse, it'd be harder to understand. But John has built us a great background where we come to this today and we go, oh, yeah, it's, he's been teaching this in several other places. So let's look back at that. Look at John chapter 1, verses 1 through Probably 1 through 3, actually. Uh, and uh, I'll throw in verse 14, but we're going to come to it later also. But John chapter 1, and look at verse 1 through 3, and we'll add verse 14 because it summarizes it quite nicely there, kind of compresses it. All right, so look at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him, was not anything made that was made. And then to take away all guesstimations on who the Word is, we skip to verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Word, who was with God and also was God. I mean, this is this Trinitarian mystery that there's no comparison on earth to compare such a thing to. So the word that is God, the word that was with God, so there is unity, but yet there is distinction, uh, put on flesh and dwelt among us. So this is God. So now to see God is to see the Son. The Son has put on flesh. Now, John opens his gospel by declaring who Jesus is. He is the word that was fully God. He was with God, put on flesh. And these passages show the distinction within the Trinity, but yet the oneness of God. So God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are one, yet distinct. Uh, this is a concept that is, that is again, it's, it's we're talking the Trinity. And anytime someone says, oh, the Trinity is like, and they give you this earthly example of it, or it's like an egg, or it's like a father, and it's like... No, no, and no. Just shake your head and say, stop talking, all right? Because it's not right. There is no earthly analogy that we, can, that we have that is comparable. But, and that's usually where people make the mistakes when they're contemplating the Trinity or trying to talk about the Trinity. They try to make something that is so unique and so mysterious only with God, they try to make it very earthly. And they do away with the biblical principles and the biblical truth to make a human earthly comparison and they try to simplify it so when you try to simplify the trinity usually you're on the edge of heresy so just re let this remain as wow this is big this is hard this is complicated we're like we're talking about god or something right yes that that's it that's what we're talking about uh look over uh, just a little bit below that in john chapter one look at verse 14 through 18 we'll have a little bit more here on this to help us with today's passage and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the, of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the father's side he has made him known. So how can one know the Father? According to the opening of John, no one has ever seen God, but yet God, the Word, God the Son, has put on flesh and has made him known. Look back at verse 18. No one has seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. So this is how we can know and how we can see the Father is through the Son. 
Uh, they are the same in essence. We talked about this back in John chapter 10. We'll touch on a little bit of that today. But we, we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are the same in substance, same in essence. And we looked at some, some words that were used there back in church history to really define that. And there were, there were major wars fought over this. Is God the Son the same or slightly different in essence or substance than God the Father? Are they equally God, or is there something less? And there was that homo usius, if you remember that, meaning same substance, or homoi, meaning different substance. And homoi is the heretical uh, Arian view of Jesus, that he is different substance, different essence than God the Father. But what we find in Scripture is that they are the same, same essence. So Jesus is not less than God. He is not the Father and the Father is not the Son, yet they are of the same substance. Distinct, yet there is a co-indwelling that unifies the Trinity. And we're going to talk about that some today. This is that unity that is there. Uh, uh, he refers to, that's why in verse 7 of John chapter 14, he says, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And he goes on to say, From now on you do know him and have seen him. Now, how many people have actually seen God? And it could be a trick question, right? How many people have actually seen God? Well, they definitely saw God the Son. We know that to be sure. But according to this passage that we just looked at in John chapter 1, verse 18, he literally says, no one has ever seen God, the only God. So referring to God the Father, but then he starts talking about God the Son, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. So uh, the way... They can know the Father is through the Son. Now, is it important to believe that Jesus is God? This has been covered a thousand times as we've gone through the book of John, but we'll just hit it one more time in case someone missed, missed this. Uh, but it's extremely important to believe that Jesus is God. He had just told the disciples again, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, taking on that title of God himself, uh, equating it. He, he is the one who gets people to heaven. He has authority who is going to heaven. He is designing heaven as he has designed earth, as he created all things. He is fully God. Uh, but John chapter 8, verse 24 through 26, turn over there with me, and uh, we'll read through verse 29 in just a moment as well, that same chapter. But John chapter 8, verse 24 through 26, 6, Jesus lets us know that it is extremely important. In fact, if you do not believe Jesus is God, uh, you are not saved. Look at verse 24 through 26. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And, and speaking with Charles just on Wednesday night, that he is not there in the original Greek, and we, we know that, but we also need, I need to say that more often, it would just be I am. So taking that title from John, um, Exodus 3.14, he applies it to himself here. What does that mean? It's highly significant because he says, unless you believe that I am God, you will die in your sins. Verse 25, so they said to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, just what I've been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to you, to the world, that I have heard from him. So Jesus uses that name, I am. Unless you believe that he is I am, then you are not saved. And the fact that Jesus is God is absolutely vital to saving faith. And it is amazing how many people will preach a gospel and not leave that fact in there. Where Jesus says, unless you believe I, that I am, you will die in your sins. There's only two ways to die. There's many methods of death, all right? But there's only two ways ultimately to die in the eyes of God. With your sins, every single one of them, face God in judgment, receive the wrath and curse that you are due, or to die with zero sins. None of your sins... And it's, in fact, the righteousness of Christ. And so there's only two ways to die. So he says you will die in your sins, with your sins, face eternity, uh, receiving the wrath and curse of God, unless you believe that I am. And, and I've told you guys this before. I had a great debate with, uh, with a, 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 a very famous, very popular author and, and writer, and he was overseeing my doctoral work, uh, that he did not believe this. 
And we went back and forth for a number of times and finally asked to be removed from under his tutelage and, and was given another professor. And even at a very high level of learning, and he had said, you're telling me that the people in my church are all supposed to believe that Jesus is God in order to be saved? I said, I'm just reading the verse. <laughs> That's what Jesus says, right? He says, it is vital. Unless if you create your own Jesus and start pulling his identity out from the word of God, you, you've created an idol. And uh, he never came to agree uh, on that. So long story short, it's not just it's not just friends, neighbors, family. It can be professors. It can be famous teachers as well, famous writers as well. Is it important to believe that Jesus is God? It is vital. If not, you will die in your sins. Now, carry on. Look at verse uh, John 8, verse 27 through 29. And this ties into that, to today's sermon, today's verses also. He said, They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me, and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. So in this passage, uh, we, have, uh, we, find, we find that the clearest revelation of the fact that Jesus is, I am, is going to happen at a particular time. When is that? If we look back at verse 28, he says, when you have lifted up the Son of Man. And what is he talking about, lifted up? This is how they describe the crucifixion. Same in, in, uh, in John chapter 13 as well. So when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know. What are they going to know? I am. That he is who he said he was all along. That he is I am. You even recall the centurion who witnessed all the things at the foot of the cross. And, and he looked up and said, surely, right? This, and it was this, this knowledge as he looked upon Jesus Christ dying. So there is this, this now that is happening where all this education the disciples have received, the people themselves have received, all the miracles, the feeding of the 20,000 people, and, and all the great teaching, all the I am statements. But yet, this is the culminating moment, the climactical moment, where his personage is going to be fully realized and they're going to fully uh, I'd see him for who he truly is in the final hour. And uh, I believe it's in John chapter, or go back to John chapter 14. Yeah, um, verse, verse 7 uh, says, From now on you do know him and have seen him. So for what is it, this is another time reference, from now on. It's, it's very similar to what we find over here in John chapter 8. When I have been lifted up, then you will know I am. And Jesus says in verse 7, from now on, you will, you will know, uh, you do know and have seen him. So that all this is this, this climactical time is happening where they're going to fully see Jesus for who he truly is and know Jesus for who he truly is. Uh, when do the disciples finally realize and acknowledge who Jesus is? It takes a long time. I mean, after all this teaching, and even here at the, in the upper room, they're still, Jesus is still teaching them who he is, and they're still not grasping it. Even after Jesus dies on the cross, are the disciples all watching him die? Are they all gathered there and looking and seeing and watching and, and acknowledging who he is? No, they all go hide. And then there are several in Luke 24 are on the road to Emmaus, and they're distraught. They don't know what to do because they thought the Messiah was going to do X, Y, Z, but now he's dead. Now, what do they do? And Jesus shows up, and then he opens their mind to understand the scriptures, and he teaches them from Moses through the prophets all that was required of the Messiah, and they see. He does that again with the other disciples there in Luke 24 as well. So it was, it was these before the crucifixion, before the death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and exaltation of Jesus Christ, these things were not fully understand, even by the disciples. But afterwards, it becomes very clear to them. It does take a lot of teaching. So if you're, in, if you're out there going, man, I'm not quite getting all this, just hang in there, all right? Look at John chapter 14, verse 8 through 9. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? So Jesus 
uh, is saying that no one comes to the Father except through him. He's already said that. Uh, And Jesus was going to the Father's house to prepare a place for them. And apparently this gets Philip thinking that all he and the disciples to, to, to quell their fears and their troubled heart, all they really needed is for Jesus just to show them the Father. So this is Philip's request. Show us the Father and it will be sufficient. It will be enough for us. It's like then we will fully see, we'll fully understand, fully believe. We will be content. Um, they will be satisfied. Now, this is where we can see the disciples had not yet embraced who truly and Jesus was, who, who he was fully. Uh, if they understood they were in the presence of God, they would not be asking to see God the Father. But they were not appreciating who was right in front of them fully enough, and that they, they now want to see God the Father. Now, Philip was asking for Jesus to show them the Father with their literal eyes to take in, for their literal eyes to see. But Jesus teaches them here that it is more needful to know God than to see God. Look back at the end of that verse 9. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Uh, So he's saying they're wanting to see the Father, but Jesus is right there in front of them. He's been teaching them all along. and He's saying, know me. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. To get to the Father, you go through me. He is, I'm God in the flesh right in front of you. The word has become, I'm right here. You're with me all this time. And yet, it was not enough for Philip at the time. Now, can a person see God? And we've mentioned this. We'll mention this a couple of times today. Uh, here in, at the end of this verse 9, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? And we, we come across this. Did, did people see God in the Old Testament? And probably some, some examples come to your mind, maybe, maybe Jacob or maybe Abraham, right? Uh, and, and the var- variations of, of theophanies or manifestations of God's presence that for the senses to be able to take in. But yet, the New Testament says over and over that no one has seen God. Uh, that the passage we just looked at, no one has seen God. John chapter 1 says that uh, no one has seen God. So can a person see God? Look at a couple of these other passages. Colossians 1, 15 through 16. Turn over there with me. Hold your spot in John 14. And you'll look up uh, some of these in your discipleship today as well. Can't cover all of the theophanies of, of God. Colossians 1, 15 through 16. Paul says, speaking of God, he is the image of the invisible God. So Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whatever, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Very similar to the opening of the, of the book of John as far as defining who Jesus is. He is the one who let, makes the Father known who is invisible, but the Son has put on flesh and made himself known. But through him, you can know the Father. Uh, 1 Timothy 1.17, To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. A great passage. If you know a little bit about Jonathan Edwards, uh, Jonathan Edwards, uh, he knew of the Bible, he knew of scriptures before he read this, but this, this verse is when he says he really came to know and to be saved. As he read this verse, it was so powerful as it resonated with him. The king of the ages, immortal, but yet invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So can someone see God? Well, here we see invisible, we invisible. Uh, Jesus actually says no one has seen God. Uh, John, John's record, no one has seen God, but the Son has made him known. All right? So with this in mind... Philip's request to see God the Father is not a realistic expectation, plus Philip is not fully appreciating who is right in front of him eating with him. Now, there were theophanies in the Old Testament. You're going to get to some of that in your discipleship time today. But as far as seeing God the Father, we see no, no, and we see that he is invisible. All right? 
Now, look, what Philip, this is interesting. This is a point where you can't apply some of this, all right, as far as a practical level. All of it's heavy doctrine today, but I think you could apply this as well practically. Uh, what Philip thinks he needs to be satisfied is that do this for me and I will be, everything will be okay. I will be satisfied. I will be content. You just do this for me. Just, just this little thing shows the Father, right? Uh, it is, is it possible that what you think you need in order to be complete is actually not needed. And that's definitely something to think on because everyone has found their, their, themselves in that kind of a situation. God, if you just do this, then I will serve you. Then I will be complete. Then I will be satisfied. If you just fix this, if you just take this away, if you just add that, then, then I will serve you fully. Then I will fully trust, fully believe. And uh, that's that's... Not what Philip does such a thing here, but we find out that that is actually not what Philip needed. Uh, he does not get his request. This happens quite often in the Christian walk. According to our limited knowledge, kind of like Philip, we ask or plead with God about what we think we need and ask or even command it of God as Philip did. Just He didn't say just. He says do this. He commands of God. But in the far superior mind of God, he knows that you do not need what you think that you need. And this happens quite often. It happened to Philip here. We must find our sufficiency in Christ. He does, Philip does not get his answer. He does not get to see the Father. Instead, where is he to look? To Christ. Find his sufficiency in Christ. All right? So, so there is some application there for everyone. Who says, I would like a point of application. There's one right there. All right? Look at verse 10. We'll carry on in John chapter 14. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. Now this passage, along with verse 9, uh, he who has seen me has seen the Father, can be difficult to grasp. Again, you're talking about the Trinity here. If you look at verse 10, the Father is in the Son, and the Son is in the Father. He even says that the Father dwells in the Son. So in some way, the Father and the Son are one, but in some way they are distinct. And this is what I forewarned you about when I opened up the sermon today. As I get ready, because there's a lot of heavy doctrine here today, because you're, you're talking about the Trinity. And oftentimes, again, we try to simplify the Trinity, and it becomes so simple, it's not the Trinity anymore. The Trinity is, 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 is mysterious, all right? It, it, is, it is difficult to, to fully wrap our minds around. Uh, if you look at this passage again, look at their, their verse 10. Um, Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? So this is the word I mentioned earlier that has to do with the intra-Trinitarian relationship, all right? You have the, they are three distinct persons, but yet they are one. They're one in essence, and there is unity that is there. So that in some way that we cannot fully comprehend, the Father is in the Son, and the Son is in the Father. But yet, the Son is distinct from the Father, and the Father is distinct from the Son. And so... Now, if your head's hurting, you're in the right spot. Keep it there. <laughs> That's where you want to be. Don't be, oh, just make it like this, a little simple thing. No, no, no. This is the Trinity, all right? So in this lies the mystery of the Trinity. Jesus taught the same thing, and we covered this lesson, if it sounds familiar with you, over in John 10. So turn back over to John 10. John 10, 37 through 38. 1 John 10, 30. Also, is one that we covered at that same time. That is, uh, yeah, John ten thirty simply says, "I and the Father are one." We'll look more into that in a moment as well. But then, verse thirty seven and thirty eight, John chapter ten. If I am not doing the if I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. So the, uh, I am, the Father, let's see, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, verse 38. 
But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know that and understand that the Father is in me and that I am in the Father. So this will have to do with the, the, the distinctiveness, distinction of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, uh, but also the oneness or the unity of the Trinity, this intra, uh, uh, intra-Trinitarian relationship. Some people refer to, to it as the co-indwelling, but it has to do with the unity of the Trinity. Now, difficult to wrap our minds around, obviously. Jesus, some things to keep in mind as you look at this. Jesus is not the Father, and the Father is not the Son. So we have distinction that is there. But yet, there is a mutual indwelling within the Trinity, and that's where it's really hard for us to wrap our minds fully around. Uh, the Father and the Son coexist at the same time. Father, Son, Holy Spirit coexist. They are equal in essence and substance, distinct in person, yet there is union within the Trinity so that there are not three gods but one. This intra Trinitarian relationship is called mutual indwelling or mutual co-inherence, all right? So it's, it's there. We see it taught in Scripture. Oftentimes in our, our limited understanding of the Trinity, we kind of do away with that part because it's easier to understand. But yet, the Trinity is mysterious, all right? There's a lot of information that's there. There's no uh, analogies here on earth to compare it to. Uh, this co-inherence relationship, though, is interesting because it's also something that Christians share with Christ as well. John mentions it in his letters, but also in the gospel. If you fast forward just a little bit, look at John 14, 19 through 20. Look what he says here. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. Look at verse 20. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. What in the world? <laughs> so it's not the, the Trinity has the indwelling, uh, the unity that is there, but there is also this, this verse 20 that happens with Christians. In that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. That this, this is unity with Christ for believers is also a mystery that's hard to comprehend. But it's amazing, and there's great assurance in it that we are in Christ. Christ is in us, and that, that we are safe, we are secure because of what he has done for us. So there's a lot more could be said on that, but let's, let's think on a few of these things to make sure we don't drift off into heresy, all right, as we're talking about the Trinity. Number one, Jesus is not saying that he is the Father. Jesus did not say that he is the Father or that the Father is the Son. The statement reveals two persons, yet one essence or substance. There is unity, the, the co-indwelling uh, that is there, um, that, that is, but it's not, uh, he's not saying that he is the Father or the Father is the Son. Uh, oneness theology sees God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit as one in essence and one in person with no distinction of persons. So that oneness theology, sometimes we'll call it modalism. It's not, it's bad, it's bad, all right? So we're not that, we teach against that, but they would say God is either the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit. The same exact essence, so much so that they're not three distinct persons. That is not the Trinity. Again, that is a heresy where in a human mind, they're like, that's too complicated, I'm gonna make it like this. Uh, it's much easier to comprehend. And once you get a, a, a trinity that is so easy to comprehend, odds are you're, you're delving into heresy, all right? Uh, so oneness theology is wrong. Trinitarian theology sees God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit as one in essence or substance, but distinct in persons. And we've gone over kind of a list like this before in discipleship and from here. But who died on the cross, right? Was it God the Father or God the Spirit? That would be God the Son. Uh, uh, who sent the Son? We find that it is Jesus. Who does Jesus pray to? Or uh, his Father. Who, who do you find Jesus praying to in the garden? Or when Jesus is baptized, you, have the, you get to see the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit all present at that time. You see distinction that is there. Uh, who did the Father and the Son send on the day of Pentecost? It would be the Holy Spirit. Also, we see the distinction as Jesus keeps saying, I do everything the Father does. I say everything the Father does. 
but we see this is a distinct role. We don't see it reversed. We don't see the father doing everything the son does and the father doing everything that the son says, but it is a dis there's distinct roles within the Trinity, all right? So number two, Jesus is not saying that he is another God, and that's important. That's the polytheism, the belief in multiple gods. Uh, monotheism is a belief in one God, and we, are, we believe firmly God has revealed himself to be one God. Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Deuteronomy 32, 39, See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God beside me. So, like a, a Mormons will believe the infinite regression of gods, that there's thousands, millions, cabillions, whatever the biggest number you can think of, of gods. Uh, that is wrong. That is incorrect. They deny that Jesus is God. They think they will be their own gods of their own planets, etc. That is polytheism. We believe in one God. Jesus is God. The Father is God. Jesus is not the Father, and the Father is not the Son, yet there is only one God. Uh, God exists uniquely in Trinity. One God who eternally exists in three distinct yet inseparable persons. There is distinction, but there is unity, and that's what we find as being taught here as Jesus is about to go to the cross. So when you look at these passages and think, oh, this is so complicated, uh, why does Jesus have to teach this? Because it's important. It's extremely important to know who Jesus is. And the more you acknowledge who he is, the more you can be assured of your salvation. Jesus is God. Jesus is, is in unity with God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. Your salvation is a work of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You have full assurance of your salvation through Jesus Christ, who is, who's, the Father is with him who has sent the Spirit, who is Christ indwells in us, and you can rest assured that you have a place in heaven. So Jesus is, a, is talking heavy doctrine to them, but at the same time is extremely applicable to their troubled hearts. Now, move on to the last verse we're going to cover here in verse 11 today of John chapter 14. John 14, verse 11. He goes on to say, Believe me, that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Now, Jesus could have said, hey, guys, I know what I'm teaching. It's pretty difficult. Don't think about it that much. I'm just throwing it out there, all right? Uh, but instead, what does he say in verse 11? He says, believe me, that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. So he teaches on this difficult doctrine to comprehend fully uh, that he is in the father the father is in him and then what does he say he doesn't say he didn't give them an out at all he doesn't say hey this is just for mature christians who have at least gone to seminary for four years and right before you graduate you can learn about the trinity uh, no he, these are his first disciples he's teaching them this it's heavy doctrine he says believe it all right? Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. And then he goes on to say, or else believe on account of the works themselves. So the works, as we've covered many times, the miracles that, that the prophets could uh, perform and had performed several times in the Old Testament, uh, where God's validating it. This is my man. This is my messenger. Uh, I'm sending him, just like Moses, right? Three signs that were given to him. He was to go show uh, so they would know that he was sent, that I am had sent him. So here Jesus is saying the similar thing. He's saying, I have these signs, these miracles. The Father has done them. What are you to do? You're to believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if, that's, if you just can't quite get there right now, you have to believe in the works that I do. Uh, regular people don't walk on water. Regular people can't raise the dead back to life. Regular people can't make well, water turn into wine or make blind eyes open, deaf ears to hear, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Jesus says, believe that. Those signs are there for believers to rest in. It is a faith. He wants this, this more mature faith. Believe that I am in the Father and Father is in me. If that's too much right now, just believe the works that I do. Understand, now, these are signs from God. What do signs point to? They point to the God, to God, 
and they point back to the messenger who's bringing a message from God. It's all unified, all right? So, in summary, um, this is a wonderful assurance to be found in this passage, not just head hurt, all right? There is wonderful assurance for the believer. And remember his audience. Uh, keep the passage in context. Who is he ta- He's not just out of nowhere speaking on this heavy doctrine. He's on his way to the cross. His disciples are troubled, and he brings this up as a doctrinal lesson, yes, but also there's a source of comfort that is there that they are to apply. Not yet, they don't, but they will soon. They'll apply this later on. Uh, uh, the Father is distinct from the Son, but yet there is a co-indwelling that unifies them and allows them to be in perfect harmony. That's what we find from today's passages. Jesus can assure his disciples and us that we have a place in heaven because he is God. God the Father and God the Son are distinct, but yet they are unified. So when Jesus speaks, it is unified with what the Father is saying. So when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and life, no one comes to the Father except through me, there's not two different opinions there. It is unified. And if your faith is in Christ, then you can be assured that you're on your way to heaven. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you've given us your word to better understand who you are and uh, pray that you would uh, allow us to be comforted by the words that are here that the disciples were comforted with as well. In John chapter 14, we find that they are troubled and, and the command to not be troubled and the command to believe in God and believe in Jesus. Help us to do the same when there seems to be things that are out of control or chaotic in this life or things that we do not understand. Help us to recall Trust in God. Believe in God. Let our hearts not be troubled. Uh, We we are not sovereign. We are extremely limited with our knowledge. We do not know what is going to happen tomorrow or in the next few moments, but we know that you do, that you are God. Help us to continue to trust in you. We thank you for the comfort that was given to the disciples and to us, even though they were about to abandon Jesus, and even Peter was going to deny Jesus three times that they had a home in heaven. It was permanent. It was assured. It was a guarantee. Uh, We trust fully in the same one who is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus, who has made the way, who has died on the cross to take our sins away. We thank you, God, that we will not die in our sins because we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. He was a very man, but he's also very God. And through his death on the cross, through his perfect life, through his resurrection, we can be assured of our salvation. We thank you for these truths, and no matter what happens in life, even if we uh, have difficult things that we can't understand, may we continue to trust. Uh, Help us to not be like uh, the the, the apostle who tried to make a bargain, and if I can only see God the Father, then I'll be satisfied. Help us to be satisfied in who Jesus Christ is, and help us to rest our salvation and our satisfaction in him. In Jesus' name we pray.